Da, da, da. Boy, oh boy. They, uh, uh I forget. What? I forget. Oh, uh, Meltdown show starts in a couple weeks. Sh shooting here? Yeah. Uh, and the, the post-production supervisor, um, uh, they hired from Funny or Die. And uh, he was the post-soup on on uh, Zach Galifianakis' new show, which Dennis was senior editor on. Are you serious? So the homie called up Dennis, like, hey, you're in London. Can you come back and edit, edit the show? Yeah. Then it's like, oh, this is actually perfect. I have to go back because of visa issues and blah, blah, yeah. blah. And then Red Hour Entertainment slash Comedy Central says, nope, got to be a union shop. What? Yep, whole show's got to be union. And I'm like, that is anti-meltdown. <laughs> union. So, like, Dennis is here. He's ready to work. He's got his okay. post soup there, and he's like, ah, I can't hire you. Because they only want to hire union. I'm like, That's what? This, this, this is what? What? It, you really won't hire the best person for the job just because he's not union? Freaking Sundance award winning uh, editor? You gotta be union. Oh my god. That's ridiculous stuff. Hey, I was, uh, I was reading up on uh, uh, Valve's. Uh, flat uh, business structure. Yeah. And uh, it's pretty good, actually. Like, their company is completely flat. And there's a bunch of Wall Street Journal articles and Forbes. That there's a bunch, been a bunch of profiles on, on the fact that Valve is a completely flat. There's Gabe, and then there's the entire company. Yeah. And people self organize. That's it. Like, yeah. there's no. There, 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 there's no uh, time. The, the, there's, there's no timelines. There's no, like, particular projects. Like, if you want to be on a project, you hop on the project, and then the team, you know, either wants you or they don't want you. Yeah. Yeah. So ridiculous. It's uh, it's tough to do. There's, there's not many companies that can do it because most people need structure. Yeah. Like a lot of blue collar well, workers. That's kind of like the Facebook. Model. No, Facebook has like level tons of levels of management. Mm, but there's lots of like, what was like Facebook, Google. There, are, those are all management structures. They, Huge management structures. They are, but like, they say that they're also like they're free forming teams that kind of do and they're given like tons of spare time to work on. Side yeah, tw projects. twenty percent. Yeah. Imagine your whole company is that. Is <laughs> as a hundred percent. Like all projects are self managed. There's there's like a. I think it's uh, uh, GM that started testing a flat management structure, which is no management. Yeah. At a couple of their factories, and it worked. Like uh, uh, pro uh, efficiencies improved. So is it when people just want to get work done, they get yeah. work done. Like there's no there's no boss to tell them, hey, you got to do this today, or you got to have this done by the end of the week. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um. I was thinking, I, I was looking it up because I kind of like the the idea of like a flat management uh, 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 process pro structure for like XSN. Like, if you got a good idea and you think it'll sell, go ahead. Like, all you, 
it's yours to fail it's yours to succeed like yeah. there's no there's no bosses because that's the nature of internet video like we never know who's gonna pop off yeah on the on but it's like also like you have to manage brand expectations yeah, yeah. because brands don't work like that yeah. like they need to know who's liable cause, because it opens them up well, to, and it's also like payment too like if you if you hire these guys on to do something and they're supposedly doing something for like a year but they don't produce anything it's like you basically you're throwing money away for a year well that's that's the truth with any employee yeah. like you know you could have a guy there for six months or a year and you know his value is not worth what you're paying him yeah so that's true about any business the thing with the thing with the flat management uh with like a, a xsn thing is that it allows self weeding like if you can't handle it you, your team's gonna kick you out or say hey we're n like you're not working like it's the team the team the teams who come up with the ideas are the response are responsible for their own ideas yeah rather than like from the top down hey we've got best buy so someone someone go sell best buy stuff like yeah. like you want people that are excited maybe they worked at best buy yeah maybe they were like yeah i could sell this All right, let's help Justin TV work. Slash the wandering net. Because I think that's the problem with a lot of video channels. They, uh, like all the MCMs, like they tried to introduce uh, management levels. Like there's always MCN, and then there's people under you, and then there's people under you. I know. I'm just waiting for Cliff. Because it's 4.57. It's three minutes to air. And we don't have a cliff yet. This is every week. There's Tetris. Everybody's here. All right, I'm. Uh, I gotta pop out the chat. Pop out. Okay. All right. Enlarge. And we're going to have a special guest on the show. I'm sure you saw the post. Uh, Cliff has scored a wonderful interview with, uh, but they're in New York. Uh, a couple authors uh, uh, that uh, imagined what if J.R.R. Tolkien, creator of Lord of the Rings, and Ian Fleming, the creator of James Bond, teamed up uh, to fight the Nazis <laughs> in World War II. And the story is what, uh, like, they're using their influence because the, the worldwide love of their books. So the government hires them as secret spy agents to go on a publicity book tour. You know, they're like, oh, just just be famous people and go to Germany. But in the meantime, they're actually spies. <laughs> uh, anyway, the authors are in New York. I thought they were here. So we're going to FaceTime with them. And hopefully everything works out. So I've got, I've got an iPad to FaceTime. I've got our chat room here. I've got our phone, which you'll be able to text us throughout the day, throughout the show, with questions five three zero six four Frodo. And uh, and uh, that's uh, that's what we're doing. So it's four fifty nine. Where's Cliff? I don't know. I kind of want. I'm, I I kind I kind of like the vibe of uh, Noel. I like the vibe that her and Cliff have. I think. Uh, oh, the ginger. Yeah, ginger hazing. Yeah. Um, and she lives really close by, and I'd love to have her on the show more. Yeah, she seems really cool. And she knows her geek. Yeah. Stuff. Sure. I hear Cliff, but um. Yeah, I'd love Noel and Cliff. 
The problem is I need to figure out a better camera angle because Cliff is up here. Noelle's like right here. <laughs> Hello, sir. Hello, everyone. Sir and sir. Hello, sir and sir. How? How? She how sent me two copies. Didn't I give you the second copy? Uh-uh. I didn't, haven't gotten anything. I thought I left it there on your desk for you. Nope. All I have is my little hobby book. Are you sure it's not in the sleeve of your car on the passenger side, perhaps? I it's not in my car. Hi, everybody. Hi, Efren. How's it going? Good. <laughs> you really good? Can you give me a minute? Did you see what I sent you? I don't know if you can use it for any backing or anything. No, give me a minute. Uh, you have to input their phone number in, uh, in FaceTime here. Okay. Uh, yeah? Right there. Yeah. Uh, input, add phone number, and then, uh, and, then, and then we can call them. Can Cliff see the chat? Absolutely he can see the chat. Cliff is doing his homework, and this is Bog. This is the original Bog. This is now a collector's item. You thought oh, we that already? this is the toy that nobody <laughs> would want to buy. Nobody would want this. So like, come on, that looks like I want. Everyone will want a, a, a Legolas or something, but this is the toy you actually want because this is Awesome Bog, not CG Bog. Uh, maybe should we call him Awesome Bog? Uh, awesome Bog. Like, come, up, I, come up with a name for this bog. There's a little bit of alliteration going on there, but I'm not sure if that's the best choice. Because awesome bog. Awesome bog just sounds like your coffee talk with Linda Roberts on Saturday Night Live. Oh, that's did just, you this see? This sounds like Mike Myers doing Long Island accent. That's fine. Like. Awesome bog. Awesome bog. <laughs> did you see anyway. Drake? On Saturday Night Live, I've never I, laughed my butt off. I did not. He did the entire episode. He was the music guest and the performing guest. Yeah, he was good. Drake is funny is as all oh, get out. Like he did. Who knew? Cat Williams. Who he knew? Did, <laughs> he did. Oh man, there were the every every single skit. He he he's 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 Jewish, so he dated Rihanna. Yeah. <laughs> He was like coming up with all these wonderful. They need to, they need to uh, have him back more. Um, and I, 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 I'll bet you by golly that uh, nobody at the Wondering here has watched Saturday Night Live in years, let alone or or has listened to uh, or has a Drake album in their possession. So I think surprised. I'm like way off target. Not at all. Or, you <laughs> might you might be surprised what's on certain people's uh, iPod shuffles. Uh, I'm sure that Drake, I, Drake iPod appears. iPod truffles? iPod truffles. Oh, that sounds so good. Did you say truffles? Did you say truffles? <laughs> do, excuse me, sir. Do you have any Grey Poupon? No, we're not iPod doing that. Truffles. We're going, going way back to the early 80s for that commercial. <laughs> Perhaps the late 70s. Anyways, welcome to Torn Tuesdays, everyone. The audience is here. I hope the audience is here. And, and I see a lot of live audience over this here. Is, this hello, is Bog. Audience. This is Bog. Say hello. Awesome, Bog. We're typing in uh, essential bits of information. In the digital age, it is necessary. That will never cost as much money now. What, taking Bog out of his packaging? Uh, there you go. You Done. know what? We didn't take him out of his packaging. We got this All right. direct from Bridge Direct at Comic Con, and he didn't come with packaging. So, <laughs> don't worry. There's other bogs. I've seen the bog toys sold in a duplicate pack of two characters from The Hobbit. Old stock. It says an unexpected journey on the packaging. Certainly, it's not Desolation of Smaug. And you'll find these things sitting around there on the shelves at toy stores and at Target. They're sitting. You know, I soon. propose. But anyways, I propose a new rule for merchandise. If your character, if your character is all CG, he only comes in holographic baseball cards. 
Like, this Con- Conan Stevens was a real actor. This is real makeup. And he was 3D scanned and made into a toy. Like, because he's real. He was a physical being with a physical presence. Uh, uh, other Bog, Movie Bog, and Azog, they're not. They're not real. They're they're all CG. And so they should be just as flat as my phone. They should <laughs> just be holographic. Yeah. Like, An interesting concept. You know, all digital. Like, the this is real Bog, Colvin, uh, Conan Stevens. I get to play with him and his big sword and club. I mean, and digital Bog. I only see him digitally. Like I, th- I think this is a fair trade. Like if you really want good merch for all your superhero movies and fantasy movies, make it real. If you make it real, you can make a real toy. If you want all digital, you make it digital, like digital goods. Uh, there ha- has to be a one to one between well, you, you're toys t- and you're, movies. The tangible, the tangible goods. Tangible. The tangible goods marketplace is is completely separate and behaves as a different beast than the digital goods marketplace. Anybody will tell you that. Yes. And I just did. Well, uh, speaking of, we have moved into an era from hardcover books to softcover books and thence ultimately to Paper e-books. Back. Paperbacks. And now we're in the land of e-books. E-books. This extraordinary book. On the iBooks. This story. extraordinary book that I'm holding in my hand right now, No Dong for Men, which I'm sure you remember as a famous an oh so nefarious bit of dialogue from Saruman, the traitorous white wizard. It is also the title of this thrilling new book, and you can get it in an ebook. In fact, it, I believe that its publication date, which was um, uh, just uh, last November, yeah, I believe that the ebook was available way ahead of time. And uh, that is uh, that is how it works with with authors these days. You can actually get the ebook months ahead of the publication date, or even before print on demand is made available, which is fascinating. Going to intangibles. Hmm? You know, I haven't about. I haven't bought a book in four years. It's all been ebooks, and I read them it's on my all iPad. All been ebooks. Do so you know what you're going to have right now today? You're going to have a live streaming webcast where you're going to e interface with the e authors of this e book. Did you know that? Oh, that's excellent. It's quite excellent, good sir. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't been here before, this is our weekly show for TheOneRing.net for fans of J.R.R. Tolkien, many of whom are particularly excited and thrilled, and some of them a bit aggravated off the deep end because of the desolation of Smaug, currently in theaters all around the world. And it just dropped off of the top ten. It's now number 11. Ah, oh, that means it's going to go out of most theaters. I, it's I was... now out of the top ten. The Hobbit, at, in its fourth, is it fourth week of release now? No. One month More later. Only four weeks? One month later. That was December 13th, and now it's December, uh, January 21st. It's been over four weeks. Finally, the film has dropped out of the top ten. It's number 11, right behind the Spike Jones film, Her which comes highly, highly, highly recommended. No. Yes, indeed it does. I saw The Wolf of Wall Street, may I tell you? I did too. I saw The Wolf of Wall Street, and I understand a lot of the controversy and a lot of the complaints that Scorsese is getting. Uh, It's a useless piece of film. It has nothing to say. It has no commentary to give, and it gives no, um, uh, like, at least in... Do you think there's actual commentary missing from a Scorsese film? He's not one to leave us anything alone without saying something about how ridiculous these people are. He doesn't say anything. Are we left to make up our own minds about how ridiculous these people are? I don't are? go to a movie to make up my mind. I would go to a movie to be told. To, oh, oh, oh. And Wall Street oh, oh. was good because you had the blue-collar dad yep. and you had uh, the son that had to make a choice between his blue-collar dad and his new dad. Uh, Sounds know, like the Great Gatsby, and 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 that's what it works. Uh, the Wolf of Wall Street, uh, Scorsese's thing. There's no good character anywhere. No, there isn't any. There isn't a single likable character in the entire three hour. But that has time. nothing to do with Tolkien. That movie was. There's mm, nothing to do with Tolkien in in Wolf of Wall Street. Nothing at all. Nothing at like, all. I just like said. Zero. I just said. I, I just said. I saw it. You know what? I just uh, mentioned you, it in passing. You know what does have a connection <laughs> to Tolkien? Let us let us find out what does have our a connection friend to who played Denethor is was just in the uh, mean, series season finale oh, of Sleepy Hollow. Oh, are you you're you're telling me that the most excellent actor from Fringe 
who yes. appeared with Leonard Nimoy, yes. who, who, who also appeared as Denethor in The Lord of the Rings. That is Mr. John Noble. Noble. You're, you're going to tell me that Mr. John Noble did a surprise he appearance at Sleepy Hollow. did an amazing... He owned the final episode of the season for Sleepy Hollow. And it, it's all, all the episodes are up on Fox.com. I highly recommend jumping in because Sleepy Hollow is good TV. Uh, and John Noble... But uh, throughout the season, what I, what he I has seen... a limited amount of, of screen time, but it looks like he's going to have more. Um, is uh, We've got questions in the chat room. Uh, Walter Mitty any good? I don't know. I haven't seen it. Uh, sometimes they go off topic. Yeah. we we're, we Sometimes we go off topic because... Uh, that does happen from time to time. Uh, you know, I really hope that... At some point, Warner Brothers says, let's keep The Hobbit in theaters. I think fans would still go see The Hobbit in theaters all year long. Just have it available as, like, even one showing a day on the weekends, in the back. You know, one of those, like, smaller theaters in the back that nobody ever wants to go into. And uh, just just keep that desolation uh, uh, going. I, I would really... I would really... What about Dobby? I'd love a Dobby toy, but he was made in a computer. Uh, and again, Dobby, Dobby would make a better app, like a her app. Dobby would make a better app like her. Yeah, a house elf yeah, trapped inside house. your inside your smartphone. Hey, That's exactly Dobby, take me to the nearest movie theater. Oh, so Dobby could be a replacement for Siri. Wow, okay, yeah. if you get Dobby's voice to replace Siri's voice, I'm down for that. Exactly. But Siri, or Scarlett Johansson, is already, or there's commentary about Scarlett Johansson's character, her, yeah. in Siri. You can actually ask Siri a bunch of stupid questions like, Siri, are you her? And she'll start giving you smart alecky responses, acknowledging the fact that there's a movie with a, with a female AI that the character falls in love with. It's fascinating. Really? Did let's, you know that let, Siri... Let's try it. Let's try it. Ask, ask Siri, are you her? Siri, are you her? No, I am me, and she is her. But you sound like her. Okay, give me a moment. <laughs> <laughs> usually, usually I ask Siri. Oh, right, she's well, has, she, has she found the the dictionary, the dictionary term for her yeah. pronoun? Let's see now. Well, Here, here's what's happening. The, the world of movies is a mercurial business, as is the world of writing and selling a good thriller. Sometimes a good thriller will show up in the pages of a comic book or a graphic novel, as many of them are right downstairs below us here at Meltdown Comics. Meltdown in the heart of... Are you an elf? Hollywood, California. Some great thrillers start as a paperback or a hardcover book or an e-book these days. Don't listen to him. Are we doing Siri again? You already own this song. No need to buy it. <laughs> you already own What's this song. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. Are you an elf? I'm not getting my Siri automatically. And I should. I should. I should get my Siri automatically when I hold my phone right Turn up. left to be... Yeah, I want a Dalek... Dalek... Siri, are you How do you, you say her? it? I'm afraid not, Clifford, but she could never know you better than I do. <laughs> I'm afraid not, Clifford, but she could never know you better than I do. Whoa, see, they, the, the programmers have designed little smart alecky responses about people assuming that her is a Siri. There was a whole news story about this. Hmm? do a lot of dictating. That's right, so Siri has recorded all of my dictation. Even all the naughty bits. <laughs> Of which there have been none. There have been none whatsoever. To whom would you like to send this message? <laughs> I, I didn't ask for a message. See, you're not doing it right. This I'm... is so <laughs> stupid. You're stupid, Siri. <laughs> to whom shall I send it? Exactly. You're still stupid. I... Siri's going to try to send a message to your digital version of Awesome Bog, which would nowhere be better than awesome the Bog. real physical version of Awesome Bog that you have. But back to our featured story ladies and gentlemen there's a fascinating world of authorship called alternate history books you know the kind where somebody will go back uh, in time and rewrite a story of what ifs if certain people had met or if certain incidents had happened uh, there's one book called the guns of the south 
uh, which I, I believe was written by Harry uh, Turtledove. Um, he is a science fiction, speculative fiction author. And his book, The Guns of the South, proposed this thing, this little posit. What if somebody had gone back in time with the time machine and had given lots of semi-automatic weapons to the rebel forces during the American Civil War? Not, not, I mean, the Confederate soldiers. All right, let me give you a hypothetical. And, and what an interesting hypothesis this brings forward and wrote an, an entire alternate history of how the course of American history changed throughout modern times to the 20th century, to the 21st century, after the South was different and the Civil War ended differently. That's an alternate history. Now, you know what else is an alternate history? There was an episode what of Family Guy that we just did this very same thing. What if falls in love with an elf? There's an alternate and history. And what if an elf falls in love with a dwarf and they start singing to the stars? That's an alternate history they, that I could get behind. That's not my idea of an alternate history. <laughs> but that's another conversation for another day. But bringing Professor Tolkien into this, and how about bringing in another popular writer of one of the most famous, famous fictional properties in the 20th century, Ian Fleming, who created James Bond, 007, the master of espionage, the great series of spy thrillers written by... Um, uh, Mr. Fleming, what if in an alternate history, Mr. Fleming and Professor Tolkien had met each other face to face and had gotten involved in a twisted, frightening, and very exciting plot against the Nazis in 1939 pre-war Germany? Now that, my friends, sounds like a really, really cool alternate history. What if they had known each other? What if during World War I, what if Professor Tolkien had met Ian Fleming's father? That's what happens in the first two or three pages of the book, and the connection between the two authors is made from the battlefields of World War I. Fascinating alternate history. And I'm excited to loan you my copy of this. Uh, uh, so I don't can, read. I know. We all know that you don't read. But you guys are going to get a real kick out of this because this super, super cool thriller, No Dawn for Men. Have you heard of Robert Asprin? Uh, I have heard of Robert Esprin. Yes, indeed, I have. We're going to get the chance to talk with Carlos Davis and James Lepore, the two co-authors of this book. And there's an even better 1980s reference to Mr. Carlos Davis that I have failed to mention. Do you remember a movie with Rick Mayall and Phoebe Cates called Drop Dead Fred? A comedy cult favorite film? I wasn't allowed to watch that. Movies like that gave me nightmares as a child. Really? Gave you nightmares? It's a comedy. It's he, a totally light-hearted, uh, coming-of-age comedy He uh, was a film. fake person he wasn't that like, did mean things it wasn't, to people. It wasn't like a Chucky movie. He was a movie. fake person he that was, did mean things to people. He was. He did mean things he to was, people. Uh, he, was, he was like Pan. He was like uh, the spirit of mischief, like Loki. He was the troublemaker. And poor Phoebe getting in trouble because Drop Dead Fred was doing all these crazy things and she couldn't tell the difference between well, reality or fantasy anymore. Can you turn the volume up real quick, please? Really, really want you guys in the chat room to give me a shout out if you remember Drop Dead Fred. If you're on the Torn Hotline, what is the Torn Hotline number? Please remind the good folks. 53064 Frodo. 530, area code, number six, number four, F-R-O-D-O. -O. Six for Frodo. That's right. You guys have to text us. You can call us. Join us on the chat line. Text us. This is going to be a really, really cool show. We're going to bring Mr. James Lepore and Carlos Davis onto the show. And we're going to talk about writing and screenwriting and literary influences and what is it like to put together... We turned it up. Do you guys hear us now? Oh, yeah. Are, 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 do I need to project my voice? Not any more than you're already doing. Not any more than I usually do. I was going to say, ah, I can hit the back room of the, of the house without a microphone. <laughs> no, it's really, really, I do not need a live microphone. I can hit the back row of the auditorium just by standing there and the whole world can hear me singing. Thank you, Dom DeLuise, playing the crow, in Jeremy. Secret of Nim. In Secret of Nim, My yes. favorite animated film. And the best. Of all time. I love The Secret of Nim. And especially Secret of Nim Jeremy and the then crow. Robin Hood. Really? For animated films? Mm -hmm. hmm, no, I would actually say Howl's Moving Castle, <laughs> uh, Princess Mononoke, and then maybe a few other Miyazaki films. That's and then better. you might put um, uh, <laughs> you might put Secret of Nim somewhere down there, but uh, that's just me. Uh, at least in at least in the top ten. At least in he the top may not 10. look like it, but inside Cliff is a little Japanese girl. 
I'm a little otaku. I'm a homegrown armchair otaku waiting to happen. You should see the cosplay he has at home. I do not have any purple hair or pink hair or fuchsia hair, although I used to. I used to have every single possible type of bright, you know, uh, Harajuku girl hair color before I even knew that Harajuku girls existed. I was doing Can it before it was trendy. Can you discuss just one hobbit related trendy. topic? Yeah, we're we're gonna we, we talked about it. You you must have missed it, Gandalf the Grey. We talked about how well, hello there, uh, alternate the realities like our book of the day, alternate realities where dwarves fall in love with elves and elves fall in love with dwarves. There and is, there's a love triangle. There is absolutely no love triangle and no cross racial. Uh, loving or romance or mischief of any kind in this book, No Dawn for Men. Let's not mix metaphors, Mr. Justin. I'm just saying, if we're talking about alternate uh, timelines, There's... and like this is like alternate 1984, like Peter Jackson uh, got a time machine in the shape of a DeLorean, and he made a mistake. <laughs> he, he was on the right track in 2003 when he won all those Oscars, and then he got in a time machine after King Kong and uh, made, made a change in the past, and suddenly Peter Jackson is now in an alternate 1985 or 2014, and that's what we have for The it Hobbit. Has, it has not happened yet that Peter has gone back to dabble or tinker with any quote-unquote revised editions of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. He yeah, but we're that. living in the alternate that. timeline. Like, we haven't seen the real timeline yet, where, like, the real timeline is that there's no love triangle in The Hobbit. We're in this alternate timeline where he thinks it's okay to, like, oh, let's just create well, then, everything. Well, then, ultimately... Alternate timelines, like this book, where none of this happened, but it's written like it did. Well, there's a great deal of entertainment to be had from alternate histories. Now, this stuff you're talking about, the desolation of Smaug, is the one thing, the most polarizing thing, that has most affected... Toriel is the Biff Tannen of Middle-earth. That has most affected fandom ever since the film came out a month ago. There has been, predictably, a split in Tolkien fandom. I, I predicted this when I wrote my film review, when it was right before the release of the film, that... Most of the fans who watch The Desolation of Smaug are going to really define themselves as book lovers of Tolkien or people who don't mind playing fast and loose with the rules of Tolkien's world and recasting it in a new cinematic light. Whatever Mr. Justin has mentioned in these divergent points of the story with Miss uh, Tariel and Mr. Keeley doing what We're they do. We're talking, the theme of the day is alternate timeline. That is not necessarily the theme of the day. That's just That's one... what this whole book is about. It's it's like a is... Tolkien and a fight in the Nazis. That's straight out of Indiana Jones. The idea of an alternate timeline with without you throwing everything around this beautiful desk, as you keep wanting to do, uh, the whole idea is that whatever Peter Jackson and his co-writers have introduced with Tariel and Keeley, and that love triangle, it's going to have to resolve itself by the end of the third film. For the other three Lord of the Rings films that come after to be narratively sound, whatever he has introduced now in Desolation of Smaug, it has to resolve itself as a story in There and Back Again. Dwalin, dude. It has to. It don't, has to. Don't you feel, after you watch The Hobbit Desolation of Smaug for the first time, didn't you feel like I must be living in an alternate timeline because this move, the things in this movie are so different than what I remember was supposed to happen? Like, we're in alternate 1985. We are. Perhaps. But, you know, George Orwell still wrote what he wrote back in 1984, and it still lingers over us today, doesn't it? So Where did Orwell come from? That's another alternate timeline of a future that never was, and yet we are still steadily encroaching towards it. You know, the erosion of personal, personal liberties, that's in all the headlines, you know? The encroachment of uh, that's spying, not, the government that's spying not on the populace. That's an alternate timeline, that's What about V for line. Vendetta? That's, that's another a V for timeline. Vendetta, uh, another alternate timeline, very popular amongst our circles. A v for Vendetta, The Watchmen. How about The Watchmen as an alternate timeline? There's, there are alternate timelines everywhere in the worlds of speculative fiction, and yet Thank you, the only thing that I was trying to say... Cheers. The only thing that... What does Tedderus say? What are you trying to... Well, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, you tell me no. what Tedderus has to say. <laughs> oh, 
See, oh, I got okay. people on my side for once. I That's have great. people on my side for I'm, once. I'm and you're just like, I'm not, no one's supposed to be on your side. I'm not. I'm because not nobody is fighting uh, on my I side. I am not disagreeing with you. I'm just trying to move the show along. I'm not trying to disagree with you at all because Peter. Um, we got just got as, a text message saying Peter Jackson knows what he's who is doing. Just trust him, Justin. I tell you what, he does. Well, he does know what he's doing, but he's changing his mind. And this is what I'm talking about. And we have it on the record that uh, when uh, uh, when they first shot all the Tariel stuff, Evangeline Lilly said, "You better not make this a love triangle. I'm sick of love triangles." Like, she's sick as an actress. She was sick of being in the middle of love triangles. And they ensured her in the first script and every in the first shoot, principal photography, there was no love triangle. And then last year, we're just talking like a year ago today, that she was back in New Zealand with for all the pickups and suddenly they add this love triangle. She's just like, ugh. Am we, I wrong? We know that they change the script every day, and so, the actors are given new dialogue the morning of their shoot that they've never seen and have never alternate rehearsed. Alternate 1985. Happens all the time. Be that as it may, I would really like to introduce our guests onto the show as they are so kindly waiting to come and join us on the live chat. Now, if we're going to be using FaceTime, which is a, another shred of Skype technology recast in the Apple light, uh, can we have only one of our guests at a time, or can we double screen and have a split screen? They're not screen? together? They are not. They're at different phones at different locations. Oh my god, why don't you tell me this? That's right. That's wrong. You didn't tell me that you said they were in New York and we're just going to Skype with them. Well, then, or FaceTime with well, them. Well, then we're going to ad hoc or improvise as we go along on this lovely live opportunity for you guys to interact with some very, very smart mm. uh, authors that I want you guys to meet and talk with. So, first off... I don't know if we have a bandwidth to do two I don't know things. if we do, but I'm just going to hit FaceTime right here, and I'm going to see if Mr. James Lepore... Happens to be interesting. He never tells I mean, me this. I mean, happens to be on his phone. I know he's very interesting. I mean, <laughs> you know what I meant to say. I meant to say, if he happens to be here, ready at his desk, ready to talk to us. That's what I meant to say. Hello? Tick tock, tick tock. This. Hook's afraid of an old dead croc. Ah, uh, yes, Captain Hook. There's a, there, that was a Captain Hook reference. You got it. You got that. That's very, very good. I just wanted to see if Mr. Lepore... Happens to be uh, at his desk. You have to wear these. Oh, I do. Oh, okay. Well, if I'm gonna wear. I see me. Hello. Are you Are you there? Can you see me? I cannot see you, we but see I can hear skin. your voice. We see skin. We see brown. I have you on my cell phone, but not on my computer. Let me see if I can reverse. Are this. we super close up? Or are we looking at the ceiling? There it is. Oh, yeah. well, there you go. Now I can see your monitor. What do you see? I see your window and your monitor. Ah, we do have Mr. Lepore on the phone. And what happens if we switch Let me reverse back to the front camera? Uh, you you just need to move your finger off of the front facing camera. Is that a finger? Yep. Wait, I saw something move. Yeah. Oh, there's something. Do you have a yellow post it over I got a post it. It looks like there's something over the camera. I don't know why it's not on the computer, though. I have my computer on with my FaceTime like, turned on. There's something... There it... Oh! Whoa. We almost saw you, something. Using an iPad or an iPhone? We're using an iPad. Do you want to His call resolution. Us? There you are. There it okay. is. There, I'm looking at my phone now. <laughs> I see my thing. <laughs> Live. Television. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not live television, but it sounds like that in my ears. It sounds like I'm in a, inside an infinity mirror in my headphones. Hello, James Lepore. How are you, sir? Good to see you. Fine, thank you. I'm fine. Very good. We can see you exactly now uh, here on, on our live webcast, and I can, I can hear your voice just fine. Are, are you actually at a different location than Mr. Davis? Yeah, I'm in Florida. Uh, Carlos is in Manhattan. Ah, very good. Coast to coast. We're doing a truly transcontinental show, ladies and gentlemen. We have one of our guests in Florida, my home state, because, you know, I, I was born in Melbourne on the on the east coast of Florida, right down there. And uh, 
we've also got Mr. Carlos Davis, who is on standby, and I'm sure he's going to be able to join us uh, after we... Uh, we'll break the conversation into different parts as we go along. Well, hello, and welcome to the show. Hello to you. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. I've oh. been listening to you guys have a sort of um, intro chat. It's pretty fascinating watching you guys. <laughs> we have, very fascinating. We, we have this back and forth all the time between Justin and myself. Um, I, I really wanted to ask you, first of all, where did you get the first uh, grains of this idea that that the creator of James Bond, uh, one of the most popular characters, uh, right next to Bilbo Baggins, what this idea came to you somewhere along the line that it would be really interesting for Tolkien and Ian Fleming to meet together. And what if they did? What would the circumstances be? And tell me, how did this all begin? Uh, it, the full credit for the idea goes to Carlos. Ah. He, Carlos wrote, Carlos, it's his idea, and it's one of the, I think it's one of the great literary ideas of the, 20, of the 20th and 21st century. I mean, these two guys together. And then he approached me. He had written a screenplay uh, that's different from the novel. Oh, really? Fascinating. He asked me, yeah, and I thought, wow, what a great idea. And he asked me to write a novel, or to help him write a novel from the screenplay. I read the screenplay, and I said, Carlos, this is not really what I do. I'm sort of write, you know, darker stuff, more realistic stuff, you know? Yes. Uh, I've never done historical or speculative fiction. And, and Carlos just smiled yeah. and said, I have to be a novel, do whatever you think you have to do. And I just wrote No Dawn for Men. I mean, with his help, we collaborated. But that's that's how it began. And, and, and it's totally his idea. Right up. That's fascinating. Oh, I see now. I see how this process works. Now, that position where you're holding your phone right now is ideal. Now we can actually see you, all of you, together. Oh. That's great. That's much better, sir. I can see you fully. Nice shirt. Very good. <laughs> the, the, the world has seen other speculative fiction uh, histories. There was one that I bumped into a long, long time ago that speculated if H.P. Lovecraft had somehow gotten involved in some kind of um, uh, uh, German uh, espionage with the Germans attempting to bring their U-boats over to Boston Harbor, which is where he was staying at the, you know, at the time in Boston. And it was this uh, really interesting, I think it was called Lovecraft's Secret or something like that. Um, but it didn't involve any other contemporary authors or any other literary figures uh, that were to meet or interact with H.P. Lovecraft. So uh, it didn't have any of that dimension to it the way that your story does. And um, it certainly wasn't anywhere as interesting and certainly not as eventful as this book. I have to tell my audience um, that the early reviews have been so strong with uh, fans who are blogging and writing about your book on, on goodreads.com and uh, reviews on amazon.com. Other fans are really coming up to bat to, to speak very excitedly about how eventful and thrilling this book is. Um, so do, do you find it hard to keep coming up with so much cool stuff that keeps happening to these characters? Yeah, it's the, it's the putting these two guys together. And once they figured out how they didn't see each other, the book almost wrote it itself. I mean, they're very contrasting people. I mean, Tolkien was a, was a family guy. He had children. He had... You know, an early marriage, and he had a very difficult life. I'm sure you guys know more about him than I do. Although the research I had to do was, you know, a, a lot of research because yes. I figured a lot of fans would be reading the book, and I don't want to get it wrong. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to get details wrong because these got the fans know more than I do. Yes. But the contra and and and, and he was a a bachelor until he was like 44 or 45. He wrote Casino Royale. And these are his words, because he wanted to distract himself from the frightening uh, thought of having to get married. 
and he <laughs> sat down and wrote 2,000 words a day for I'm telling you. And you know, he was a pretty much of a he was a playboy. Um, lots of babes in his life, and you know, Tolkien was not that. He was a traditional. He was a devout Catholic. I don't think I don't think Fleming had a, much of a religion. And, but the two of them, in my mind, started and on the page, started to work together, almost like a father and son relationship. You know, yes. Tolkien obviously being the father. Um, uh, Fle- uh, um, Fleming's dad did die. Uh, did die. He didn't die in the battle with Somme in, in the early part of the war, but he died later on in the war when when Ian was only nine. That's and I right. Think that shaped his life. Uh, uh, he lost his dad. Ian, so, Ian Fleming's father anyway, died the on the Western Front. He, he died on the Western Front in, 19, in, in 1917. Yes. yes. Fleming was nine. That's and, and Tolkien served. He, he was in the Battle of the Somme, and he, was, he, he, he got sick there. He got some kind of an infection and was shipped home, and, and he never, never had to go back. That's uh, right. He was there. He was in war. And lots of people talk about, you know, that's where the whole, you know, uh, Sauron came from, the, the, the whole evil... This this all 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 encompassing evil that's going to take over the world. That you know he got that idea from Germany from the from the First World War, but he, he denied it and all of his life. He denied it. He just said this is my imagination at work. Uh, but it, you, know, you know he did run into some evil evil stuff there in World War One, and then all of a sudden World War Two comes and it's even worse. You know Hitler's even worse than the guys of World War One. You know? Oh yes, very much. This is. Where uh, the imaginative, this is where the imaginative rubber meets the road. When you can imagine uh, a telegraph uh, signal operator, uh, a young Tolkien, all of a sudden bumping into an older um, soldier who happens to be Ian Fleming's father. And it happens in the very first three pages of the book, which connects these two characters in a way and Ian Fleming that you mentioned who was only nine years old when his father died in in the war then he would later perhaps grow up and have a purpose have a mission something that involves Professor Tolkien's great knowledge and his uh, knowledge of certain ancient things and then what would happen and, and I love where the book goes what would happen if Professor Tolkien found himself caught up in a nefarious plot in pre-war Germany in 1939 because coincidentally with The Hobbit was published in 1937 and as you know as everybody knows it was very 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 popular in Germany and Mr. Tolkien was invited to go to Germany and he actually wrote in one of his published letters um, his stance against the Nazi race doctrine which became a well publicized letter and I know you're familiar with that one too are you not? I am yeah I mean he he it, it, it was pretty popular among among ardent Nazis in Germany they, they, they saw Smaug as a metaphor for for England, who was who wanted to devour all of Europe, you know, to, you know, uh, hoard all of uh-huh. Europe's goods, and you know, Germany, Germany felt itself mistreated after the after they had to surrender in the first war, and this the Hobbit comes along. I think they misread it completely. Tolkien was shocked to hear uh-huh. how it, how it was being read in, in Germany, and he they did ask him to come over, and he went over. I mean, he would have gotten an advance, and you know, I'm sure he. Could have used the money. He had four kids at the time. Yes. And um, yes. And but the publisher put a piece of paper in front of him, and which was an oath, where he swore he was not a Jew. And yes. And he walked away. That's right. And then he wrote that famous letter, which, which basically said, "I'm appalled. I'm appalled that you would ask me that." And he's a, he's of German descent, so he said, "You're making me begin to be ashamed of my ancestry." So, I mean, that story alone... Indeed. That is fascinating. I I hope that my audience can hear the audio as well as uh, it is being uh, uh, featured through the the headphones that I can hear. But I'll I'll repeat for some of the younger uh, students of Tolkien who have just come into our show that Professor Tolkien was asked to write down on a sheet of paper in, in the late 30s 
that he was um, uh, that he was in agreement with uh, uh, that he was a, a German and that he was a proud German, and uh, they asked him to write this document about his agreement with uh, uh, the Nazi the Nazi approach to things, and he refused to sign it. That he was not a Jew. Oh, that he was not a Jew. They had that's right. Laws in exactly. They, the racial laws. Exactly. That's right. In Germany, Jews could not. They could hardly be anything. Maybe a waiter or a waitress. They couldn't have professions. Uh, they couldn't marry Aryan people. That's I mean, right. It was awful, awful set. Of, this was required. Right? That's good. So yeah, they did, and they asked, uh, and he was so offended. Professor Tolkien at the time uh, wrote a letter uh, to his to his publisher, I believe, about his uh, unwillingness to write anything about this this uh, this demand about that he would say that he was not a Jew, and it was already very clear he was of German right. descent with his last name, obviously. That is fascinating to me. That therefore, uh, in your speculative book, here we go, uh, this wild and great thrill ride of a story where Professor Tolkien is pulled into all these things that are going on and this evil, evil weapon of the occult that uh, the Nazis are developing, which is, um, which goes along very well with uh, uh, a lot of existing uh, theory. Uh, we have background music now, do we not? Where'd that background music just come from? I'm sorry, I can, can you hear that? James, can you hear the background music? I can your, your, your viewers can hear can hear me. Yes, actually, they said the audio is I can quite hear good. You well. um, that good, is correct. Good, that, good, now, good. I'm going to take a I'm going to take a second uh, while I have you here on the live feed, and I'm going to take a look at some of the questions and the comments that are coming to me right now live in the chat room. Um, yes, uh, uh, Tolkien esque has said. Uh, uh, it makes me really happy to hear that about my favorite author, that he would stand his ground and uh, not be played along uh, as a pawn in this uh, pernicious race doctrine, which is the words that Tolkien said. He called it a pernicious race doctrine. I remember him saying that. So, um, he did. Indeed. And, and what does that say? About I'm sorry. Please, sorry, James. Please repeat that. I mean, what does that say about Tolkien's character? Indeed. That he turned down money and a, and a much larger readership um, because it was morally wrong. The guy, it was a pleasure to get to know the guy, I mean, in the research. Stuff. And then I used my imagination, you know. I mean, in the, in the prologue on the World War One battlefield, Tolkien, Tolkien St. Benedict's Medal before he Benedict's same that medal he gave to Valentine and even his father because he well that medal comes up later in the story much later very very moment when there's a lot of danger facing these people. It was fun to write. Ah, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Now, some of, some of the audio is going out. I'm losing some of your voice, uh, Mr. Lepore. I'm sorry to say that. Um, but, uh, yeah. No, no, I just heard some of it there again. But don't I worry. think there's a bit of a delay, too. There is a little bit. Oh, now I heard you very clearly just there. I heard you very clearly just there. Now, some of the fans in the chat room wanted to ask you, what did you think of the current film, The Desolation of Smaug? And overall, what do you think of some of these interesting departures that Mr. Jackson is giving us in the film version? What do you think? I, I've, I've saw The Hobbit. I haven't seen The Desolation of Smaug. I, I, I'm actually writing the second Tolkien Fleming novel now, another one that takes place. This one takes place in oh, really? France in World War II. Um, uh, I don't like the idea of, of deviating too much. I'm a novelist, don't forget. So if someone were to make, a, were to make a, no, a, a movie of one of my novels, I don't know if I'd like them taking too many liberties, you know what I'm saying? So yes. I side with Tolkien on, yes. on, on this issue. Ah, um, indeed. So, okay, so not having seen it, though, I mean, it, 
That's very exciting. You have something to look forward to, to actually see the film, um, because it is very entertaining, yes. even though it doesn't represent the book and, <laughs> at, by the time it's over. But that's exciting news that you're working on the next book after No Dawn for Men. I am. There it is. There it is, right here. That's see the it? book. Right yep. here. I'm trying to show yep. the camera. Yep. Now, that's, that's very, very exciting. After we... After we chit-chat for another quick minute, we're going to get Mr. Carlos Davis on the phone, and I guess we'll do another segment. Now, we're going to ask him a couple of questions as well. Um, what's your favorite, sure, what sure. Is, what is your favorite part, James, about being able to co-write with someone and enjoy a collaborative process with another writer? Tell me about that. Well, I, I thought my imagination was pretty rich, but Carlos, Carlos beats me. First of all, this is his idea. And yeah. then every time I, I, I was stuck um, or, you know, the, 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 the conceit of the novel is that as Fleming and Tolkien have these experiences in 1938 Germany, they, they, come, they, they experience things that inspire them to write, that wind up in their novels, respectively. There's a torture scene where Fleming almost gets tortured that winds up in Casino Royale. There's a trek through a, the Bavarian forest with, uh, you've, you've, you've read it, thank you, Cliff, for reading it. There's a trek that really mirrors the fellowship, you know? And of course, it, it, you know, the, any, any fan's gonna see this. It's, some, of the, some of the parallels are more subtle, but I, that's the conceit. They, they have these experiences that, that really inspired them to, to, to put similar experiences in their fiction when the right time comes. Um, so, you know, my favorite part, I mean, I, I, I like, I, I mean, I like the trekking with, with the, there's winds up being three dwarfs. Um, of course, one of them, one of them is the Gimli character. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's a Czech, very heroic Czech freedom fighter who parachutes from an airplane and helps them along. To me, he, mar he mirrors Aragorn. Oh, that, I, I like the, and then. I was, yeah. I was wondering, yeah, if, it there's was, another I was wondering character. if that might have been a Legolas parallel, but that was an Aragorn parallel. <laughs> I think, I th yeah, I think it's more of an Aragorn parallel. Um, I, I just, I, I like the idea of, of, of mirroring, the, mirroring the fellowship. Um, there's some river people, of course, that on The Hobbit, but, you know, I sort of mixed, I sort of mixed up the two novels a little bit there. I mean, The Hobbit and the trilogy. That's okay. Uh, but th it was just fun to, 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 to put... What I did, what I tried to do, let me put it that way, was put Tolkien especially in, in, in a world that woke him up. The, the world, a lot of evil, the Nazis were the, the, the worst evil of, of, of our lifetime, I, I, I believe, and, but also woke, woke up his, his, his creative juices. I think, from what I read, he was sort of had some writer's block around 1938, trying to get on with the with the trilogy um he wanted to write something more like the hobbit and his publisher said we don't really want that again mm -hmm. we think that's more of a children's book and he and they had a little bit of a battle but and then he had some writer's block so what i'm thinking is that i mean fictionally that maybe this adventure in germany unblocked him and he got home and he was went full speed ahead writing the trilogy Oh, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. I know. I, I know also that uh, Professor Tolkien was very interested in having his publishers uh, look at the Silmarillion, and they wanted nothing to do with that at the time. That's what I'm talking about, yep. Cliff. That's exactly what I'm talking about. They said no, no, no. I think it was a little too esoteric for them. Mm -hmm. They didn't think there was a readership. And they, and, wanted, uh, they wanted more of a Hobbit sequel instead of uh, the Silmarillion and with its dark and very, very dense uh, mythological uh, constructs. And it's it, it doesn't even read like a narrative novel anyways. Uh, not, no, so. no, it's too dense. That, 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 and, 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 he, and he trumped them. He came up with the trilogy, which took yes. a long time to get published. But, yeah. but, but man, did it change yeah, it took him 17 years of revisiting that material to get the Lord of the Rings out of him. And by the end, I remember uh, there was a famous quote. He wrote to his publisher and said, I'm afraid that the work has now spiraled entirely out of my control. I have created 
a monster. I have created a monster. Unquote. That's what Tolkien said of his of his yeah. own work at the time. But he was for, yeah. he was forewarning, yeah, for you know, his publishers. I've got twelve hundred pages of this stuff now. What am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. this is so yeah. exciting. Um, I'm always excited in talking with other writers and screenwriters, and um, you have experience writing uh, thrillers, uh, some that have done quite well and gotten a lot of attention. Before I let you go, I'm going to leave you with a quick comment that I found on uh, a, a, a fan's review of No Dawn for Men, where uh, the reader uh, says uh, in very, very excited terms that and I, I've almost gotten near the very end to finish the book. I haven't finished it entirely yet, but I'm excited to see what this reviewer mm. is talking about because she says, oh yes, there is an ending, an ending to this book that is so, so, so stunning that it will leave you dazed for minutes, if not hours. And, and they, they praise the book so heartily, and I'm excited to see what the stunning ending is because I want to be stunned when oh, I get to the end. So uh, that's all built up to what we expect to happen, and um, it's very exciting to work with uh, uh, a co-writer of one of my favorite comedies from the 80s. I love the movie Drop Dead Fred. It's so fun, so much fun. And I never, yeah. ever thought that he would get involved with doing a Tolkien story or an alternate history, um, which I thoroughly approve of, even though my co-host thinks that alternate histories may be somewhat of a challenge for our readership, but I don't think they are. <laughs> so, um, no, I don't think so either. No, not, in, not at all. Now, I'm, I'm going to uh, let you go, my, my dear James Lepore. It's really good to have you on the show. And we're going to talk to Carlos Davis in, in a moment just now. And uh, the fans who are in the chat room uh, say uh, thank you very much. And please, one last thing. What would be your one-word review of The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, that you saw last year? You did see it, and tell us, what's your one-word review of that film? One word. One word? One word. I... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, you know, I should be able to do it. I was thinking of high drama, okay? Uh, but that's two words. Okay. It's two words. Let's make hyphenate it, it. Make it hyphenated. High drama. There you go. Hyphenated. High drama. <laughs> that's right. great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lepore, and all the best of luck with this well, really cool story, No Dawn for Men. And we're going to chit chat with your co author right now. Thank you, Cliff. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you very much. I hope, I hope we can uh, revisit and have an online series of questions for uh, print uh, that we'll put on the main website. And we'll follow up with you. Thank you. Oh, right. Very good. That was fun. That was Mr. James Lepore. I couldn't hear anything because Cliff's got the headphones, so... Uh, you couldn't hear I'm it? I'm just doing my deal. Oh, yeah. So, well, welcome back. Well, I can hear exactly what Mr. Lepore was saying, and he had to research Professor Tolkien, and he talked, um, he talked about a very important episode in Professor Tolkien's life when the Nazis demanded that Tolkien write on a piece of paper that he was not Jewish so that they could continue to celebrate this mistaken symbolism uh, uh, that they read in The Hobbit. You know how popular The Hobbit book was with Nazis at the time in 1937 and 38? They thought that Smaug, the dragon, represented England wanting to take over uh, and claim all the wealth and all the resources of all of Europe. They did. And, no, but that that's what the nazis believed the, was the a previous bit of, 200 years proved that they thought that the propaganda was tolkien the german writer putting in a bunch of stuff that was pro-nazi and pro-aryan in sentiment in the content of the hobbit which thematically is not there not there at all certainly not there and uh professor tolkien was so upset that they asked him uh to uh, come on this German book tour, but before he could come on the German book tour, he had to sign a waiver saying, I'm not Jewish, because they were implementing uh, uh, laws to eliminate and persecute uh, Jews everywhere at the time, as you know. So uh, no better enemy in any Steven Spielberg film than the Nazis, as we know, the most reliable villain in any good rip-roaring story at the end of the 20th century. It usually is the Nazis as a great enemy. But now, let's bounce a couple of thoughts with Mr. Carlos Davis. I want to talk to him about Good. Drop Dead Fred, and I want to talk to him about No Dawn for Men. I have no idea. Hey, there's a, uh, yeah. And I we, want to talk to him about The Hobbit. We're, we're seeing the Ustream riot. We've got an actual employee of Justin.tv, like, 
uh, in the chat room. So uh, talk your heads off because he's listening. Yes, absolutely. You guys, and he's hey, tell. Well, there you are. It's Carlos. I was Davis. trying to see if I could get on. Hold on a second. I was trying to see if I can just get on. Well, anyway, you'll have to. All you'll have to do, Mr. Davis, and welcome to the yes. show. All you have to do is lower the volume on your monitor on your computer. So on. You yeah, very good. And then there you are, looking very fine, good sir. So good to see you on the show. Thank you. And so are you, sir. <laughs> I'm, hello. Uh, so there you are, in New York City. We just talked all the way down to uh, uh, coastal Florida, my my home state. And now here we are in Los Angeles, all together, thanks to the magic of Al Gore's the interwebs. That he invented. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's it's a very big, big pleasure to be here. And I loved uh, I loved uh, your interview with Jim. He's oh. such a great guy. Oh, he As is. Are you? He is really well. Thank you kindly. Um, I'm so energized and excited. <laughs> Let's start off with a couple of questions about what's it like to be the guy who wrote this awesome and and perhaps sometimes overlooked cult favorite from the 80s. I love Phoebe. I love Rick Mayall. What's it like being the guy behind uh, Drop Dead Fred? Well, I, I co-created, wrote it, and produced it. Um, so I, I bear a lot of responsibility for it. Um, oh, it's one of my it, favorites. It was an absolute... Oh, thank you. That's very kind. You're a man of wit and intelligence. Um, <laughs> it was really a delight. It really, really was. Uh, Rick Mayle, who's also a dear friend, uh, um, uh, and it was the, the best collaborator could ever find like that. And, uh, a character created wholly terrific. And um, back, there were problems, as there are in all films, how, how you do it. But I'm uh, very, very proud of that film and, and how it turned out. And also, how loved it is, and and how uh, there are people who come up to me every day and say, my God, it's one of my favorite movies, or it is my favorite movie. And a lot of people, women especially in their 30s or 40s, said, it saved my life, which I was shocked to hear the first time, but I keep hearing it. So it's, oh, wow. a, it's a great experience. That's great. And Rick, Rick Mayall's character is the ultimate uh, puck from Midsummer Night's Dream. And... Uh, Correct. Just re recreated well with the, the spirit and the, uh, and the crazy energy that Rick Mayall has and a perfect foil to him, sweet, doe-eyed Phoebe. <laughs> That's right. I love that. Phoebe, story. actually, I've known, she was, I've known Phoebe since she was about 12 years old. Yes. Um, character actor. She, um, many years before, I was doing a, another film, and she came in and auditioned, and I always thought she was terrific. And actually, in that film, we used Cynthia Nixon in her first film ever. But uh, so, oh, wow. but Phoebe, I always had in the back of my mind, and I always, um, she lived in New York, I live in New York, and so by the time I dropped it, Fred rolled around. She's the one I really wanted, and we got her. That was fun. Yes, I, love, I loved her in Princess Caribou, another one of my favorites that she's in. Yeah, that, that followed us directly after uh, Drop Dead Fred. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's, that's you know, I, um, I, sometimes when I see her, and when I run into her, whatever, she always says, Carlos, it's not Gremlins, it's not Princess Caribou, it's not um, uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, but everybody keeps always asking about Drop Dead Fred. Again, the film just has this pull yeah. on people that's really, really amazing. Uh, thank you. I, I'm so glad uh, to, to speak <coughs> with you, uh, an original artist, and I'm uh, talking about their original work. To any of our fans who are uh, here in the uh, chat room, it looks like one of our fans, whose name is Light of the King, she's talking in the chat, and she says, Phoebe Cates and Rick Mayall, classic. See? And, and she knows a good movie when she sees one. Um, and uh, oh, to some of our friends, if you guys have not seen it, please go back and check out Phoebe Cates and Rick Mayall in Drop Dead Fred, and you guys will really enjoy uh, a very satisfying uh, coming-of-age story, and um, I love I love to see Shakespeare's characters revisiting other people in our lives and in other places and times. Um, and I can <laughs> see where your inspiration came from so much. Um, but now moving on to other imaginative fiction. Let me let me just say one last thing, if yes. I may. If I could, sorry to interrupt, but, but just a, a little plug. Um, I'm working with Rick, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm working with Rick right now. I'm <clears throat> going back to London. Um, we're doing another film together. Uh, where oh, really? He plays Fagin in 
completely different version of Oliver Twist. Very, very different. And he plays Fagan really, very much in the drop dead Fred mode. It's going to be something else. That sounds fantastic. We'll I'm waiting for his comeback. That sounds fantastic. That sounds really, really, really good. Sign me up. Sign me up for that, Carlos Davis. I love that. Um, I'm going to ask you about The Hobbit. Do you have, uh, a, in your yeah. professional opinion, do you feel these hot button issues with the adaptations of the Hobbit films now going so divergent from the Tolkien original. What do you think? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, first of all, I've, I've sort of I've loyalties uh, in the original Lord of the Ring films. Um, I'm friends with with a few of the cast members and know um, one of the producers of it quite well. Uh, one of the associate producers of it almost as well. So. So I'm very much a partisan of what Peter Jackson did in the original ones and what he's doing on the first Hobbit movie and now the second one. So I've gone into all of these. I've sat down, been very privileged. I've always seen him a little earlier than everybody else. And but I've always sat down and just said, my God, these are amazing films. And the same is really true right down to these two. And I know liberties have been taken. And I know it should be one movie, but it's in fact three yes. if you base it on the book. But there's... I still think that they're absolutely wonderful movies. Absolutely wonderful. I mean, it's what movie making on that type of movie making should be about. You sit there and you you are in wonder, you're entertained, um, you're wowed by it. I love them. So I, 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 I have to color everything through that, that uh, filter, through that lens. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. No, I appreciate that because I I I love I love the films too, and I I'm very excited by the, <clears throat> the new energy and the the new approach to uh to what Mr. Jackson is doing. But I can also understand the voice in the back of my head, which was always you know a, an 11 year old boy reading The Hobbit for the first time. And I do sometimes stop and wonder if you know if that conversation of one film instead of three it, because conciseness in writing a screenplay you know what it's all about being concise when you write a screenplay when you have to use the briefest amount of time to show large strokes of emotional space and and movement in the narrative and but but peter has given himself a lot of breathing room with three movies um and uh, a, a lot of extra material from the appendices in the back of the lord of the rings so i have described it to my audience many times as not the hobbit but it's rather the hobbit 2.0 and that's exactly what we're getting i think well, it is a Hobbit 2.0. The other thing that, that's interesting is that um, I, I, I have a friend who has a 16-year-old daughter uh, who's a huge Hobbit fanatic, and her best friend, another girl who's 16, another huge Hobbit fanatic, loves the books. And when they saw the second film, they saw a small they were completely disillusioned. They were, they were, they were furious. <laughs> that they took all these things. So what's fascinating is there's a whole new generation of Tolkien Hobbit who are indignant about that second movie, which is interesting because I loved it, but you know, what can you do? <laughs> but, but it's interesting that there is, there is that sort of uh, tradition that keeps, that keeps uh, going on about people who are extremely faithful to that beloved novel. Yes. Even now, 16 years old. Well, I, I mean, I, I thought that it was interesting that the Lord of the Rings trilogy seemed to be such a strenuous effort to give fan service to the fans. And, you know, that's a term that we have in, in the geek culture. You get fan service, not from a filmmaker like Michael Bay, who takes the Transformers movies and turns them into a complete unintelligible mess that is, isn't anything at all like the original story and animation that the fans love but but then you get really good fan service from peter jackson and from uh, fan you know fan filmmakers like tim burton who is himself a fan of the properties that he's uh, adapting but and peter jackson gave us so much good good fan service in the lord of the rings movies when i see the deviations in the story from the hobbit films i think we're not getting fan service anymore but what we're getting is a re Imagining a total reinventing in this approach to telling this story on film, and it is fascinating to watch. Um, right. let, let me move on to No Dawn for Men. P 
please tell me how did Saruman's famous moment and his famous dialogue become the title of this very, very exciting story? Well, I think that's a question you should ask Jim because it was really uh, his, um, <clears throat> his uh, and I'm sorry that we both can't be on together, but uh, that, was, that was his inspiration. Um, mm. It fits so well uh, for the story that we were telling that uh, it, 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 it just was the, the perfect, perfect title for that, for that novel. And, I, and, of course, it came from talking from um, uh, the second book. Yes. Um, interestingly enough, in, in the new book that we're, that we're writing, um, uh, it, it, it is not a token title. It's called God's Formula. And so... Uh, uh, again, I'm sorry, know, the sound, the sound well, went out for one quick second. What's it called again? God's Formula. God's Formula. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, which, which is not a token title at all, yeah. of course. And... Um, uh, which fits perfectly for for the subject matter for the second one, so it, it's it's um, it was just that uh, no dawn for men was just a perfect, just, just spot on perfect title for for the uh, for the first novel. What was going on and and well, you you've read the book so you know. So it it, it just works so well. It does. Yeah, almost finished. Almost finished with uh, I'm getting to that point well, you're, where you're about, you're about to come to an interesting point in the book if, uh, if you're almost finished uh, 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 I think it's amazing what twist at the end tell tell me what are the prospects of no dawn for men being adapted into a, a telefilm or a theatrical film high very high oh good and, oh good uh, good talking, good good yeah. no, we're talking to several people right now both here in the united states and in england uh in the uk and we're trying to figure out what is the best venue for it. Um, Jim and I have, have talked about three books. Um, the first one, of course, is published. Got published December 3rd. The second one will be published next September, God's Formula. And there's a third that follows it. All of them have Tolkien and Fleming as, uh, as their protagonists. It is such a cool combination. And such all, a cool matchup. You know, all, all, all of them, yeah. But what well, it is, but, but all of them touch on real events that happened um, uh, to Tolkien Fleming. For example, um, in the second one, uh, Fleming is in Paris and he's trailing uh, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, uh, which in fact he did uh, because they were thought by the British government, by Churchill, by the Secret Service to be uh, um, agents of uh, possible, uh, the German agents could possibly turn them over uh, to the Hitler side. So, uh, but in each one, there are historical moments grounded and anchor the uh, the novels so uh, that's what we're doing for the three novels so it's not just completely crazy and also it's interesting because it's not ragtime you know the, the famous lovely doctor L novel either which is also the same sort of imagined thing where you have a, a fictional family but they're surrounded by I, I think it's 32 historical figures from Henry Ford to uh, filmmakers in LA to uh, uh, my god uh, Stanford White you name it Anyway, yes, the the um, forgive me the 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 idea that you were going to put together two of everybody's favorite authors can be any number of things. Let's put Charles Dickens sitting down at the table with uh, um, uh, perhaps uh, forgive me um, uh, Lewis Carroll, uh, even though they were certainly not in the exact same time frame. But uh, everybody could speculate uh, what it would be like. Uh, in the world of comic books, I think you are familiar with Neil Gaiman and his writing as the Sandman author. Yes, I am. And he he loves to play fast and loose oh, really? right. with, with uh, famous literary figures and, and putting uh, fa famous authors and, and artists together in his reimagined uh, mythologies. Don't, don't you find that appealing? It's so appealing when people do that. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and there are many precedents for that, of course. The, the Tolkien Fleming one is really interesting because here's here's the truth in 1938 the year we we base um no dawn for men tolkien was approached by uh, a german publisher uh, to, to to have the book translated it was very popular in english herman goring had uh, was one of his favorite books Her herman goring grew up in britain and uh, he was educated there and so he could read english fluently he yes. loved the book yes and so you had 
you had all these people, that, all, the, all the Germans, Nazis or otherwise, who adored this book. And of course he would go there to try to get a, a translate, uh, to sign the translation until um, he was confronted by the, uh, 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 you have to si uh, certify that you're not Jewish doctrine, which absolutely called them. But you also had Fleming there in 1950. Um, he was there as a spy trying to impress his superiors in the British Secret Service. So both men. And also the other thing that's fascinating is came out in 2009 after, with the uh, release of documents from the Secret Service Act hmm. that um, Tolkien was a spy for the British Secret Service in 1938. During that period, he went to, um, that he went to uh, uh, Berlin. So the idea that you, Tolkien was a spy then, he, he, the fact, and you had Fleming there who was a spy for the Secret Service, they could very well have met, probably they didn't, but it's actually grounded in the real, a historical reality, which is absolutely true. That's they both were there at the same time in Berlin. Fascinating. That is a fascinating thing to, to put Ian Fleming and Tolkien together might not be so far off from the facts that they may have known one another at the time. What's interesting, however, in this uh, narrative, Professor Tolkien has published The Hobbit in this world timeline. However, Ian Fleming is at the point in his career where he has not yet written a single word yet of what will be the James Bond stories. Correct. Interesting, interesting background. Ian Fleming, who went to... Um, Eaton, one of the best schools, basically what we would call high school here, perhaps, right? uh, kicked out. Kicked out of Sandhurst, basically our West Point. Never went to college. Tolkien, an academic. The amazing differences between them. And yet, Fleming um, loved books, loved rare books. And he made his living when he lived in Germany um, uh, by buying and selling rare books. So um, they, so Fleming had this sort of literary side to him, um, in some form, and he was a frustrated writer, <clears throat> and he kept complaining about that. If you read his letters, all during the war when he was working for the uh, the British Secret Service, he never was in the field after the first book and, and the second book that writing uh, came out. He was always had a desk job because they said Ian right. Fleming could not pull the trigger, and so. He had, and one of his operations was, uh, that, that he engineered in his mind, imaginatively, was Operation Goldeneye. Um, and so the man actually um, had literary leanings and aspirations all through the war. And when he finally got a chance to write about an alter ego about himself, uh. that's where Bond came from. A man who did not pull the trigger in real life has a man who has a license to kill. In his fictional as his alter life. ego yes i had i had heard that story um yeah. mr uh, mr fleming was born with quite the yeah, can I, uh, uh, cliff, cliff, yes. if i can tell you one thing that's interesting yes is there is there is one man who, who knew tolkien and knew fleming and that man interesting enough was christopher lee christopher Ooh. lee was really? fleming's cousin and he also knew really tolkien very well and he actually asked Tolkien if, if there was ever a version of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, if he could play Aragon. And he also asked Fleming if there ever was a version of, the, of his first Bond book, could he play Bond? All right? Really? But so he was, he, because oh, he's very wow. close to Fleming. And he's the one who, who actually told a, a friend of mine, who's one of the producers of Lord of the Rings, who said, you know, the thing about Ian Fleming was he could never pull the trigger. That's why he got mm. taken off as a field officer, and yes. that's why he became um, uh, oper uh, behind the desk uh, in, in the British Secret Service during the war. So he had wow. that frustration, and plus he always won, he always won the right. So um, so there you are. That's, that's, that's why he ultimately started writing the Bond books. So the six, the, degree, of the, the six degrees of separation between Tolkien and Fleming in real life was only one degree of separation. Justin, did you hear that? One degree of separation between real life Ian Fleming and J.R.R. Tolkien, and it was none other than Christopher Lee himself. That, Carlos, is fascinating. That's totally fa and it's, it's, 
not surprising when I think about the unbe unbelievably rich tapestry of Christopher Lee's life and all the people he has known and all the wars that he has fought in and the, 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 all the acting roles and all the people he's known. But that, I never knew that. I'm fascinated. I never, ever knew that before. Um, uh, is it, is it possible? Sorry. I, if, there's any, if there's any way you could get Christopher Lee on, it's a wonderful thing to ask him about. I would He's love very to. forthcoming about both men. He is, he is one of the few people that I have yet to interview. Of all the many, many cast members I've interviewed, he is the, one of the very last ones. But um, I have to say, if, if it is a high possibility, as you have disclosed, that No Dawn for Men might see the light uh, in a whole new uh, film adaptation, it must be exciting to think of who you would cast to play the role of Tolkien. It goes hand in hand with the recent announcement I read in Variety that they are going to do a very special biopic of Tolkien's life. Did you read that in the news recently? Really? Yes. No, I, that's the first I hear of that. Yep, they're well, going to they're going to well, do. Do they have anybody for that? No, I have no idea who who the casting could be. But if they do show Professor Tolkien in different a ages and of his, of his life, there may be different actors. Um, but I'm very very. Uh, excited about all, the idea of who gets to play Tolkien himself on screen. And this is a whole different type of fandom that I'm sure all these Lord of the Rings and Hobbit fans are going to follow very, very, very much with interest uh, what you're doing with No Dawn for Men. Um, I'm going to tell you guys in the chat room, I'm, I'm looking at you right now, um, uh, and over here the chat room is exploding saying, imagine if they did get Christopher Lee on Torn Tuesday. Uh, I'd love that. Nobody would be happier on this earth than me if I could do that. Um, uh, and I, I wanted to tell my friends in the chat room, you guys need to check out No Dawn for Men. You can download it on Amazon.com and get the paperback. And you can also get it on eBooks. Is it also available on iTunes iLibrary? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. Absolutely. And, and, and I, you know... I, I co-wrote it with, with my dear friend James Lepore. I got to tell you, it's a, as you well know, it's a wonderful read. It's so much fun. It was fun writing. It's a fun, fun read. Yes, and it is. It's not that far from the truth. That's the thing that's wonderful. It's not far fetched by any stretch of the imagination. Even even though there's some imaginative, really, really wild imaginative. Um, uh, it's a thrill ride of a story. If you guys like to read really good page turners that take you through significant places in Europe, like a good Dan Brown story that takes you around all these wonderful places of art and history and things that are happening in Europe at a certain time, you're looking at a very special little slice of time when Professor Tolkien may or may not have bitten off more than he can chew with the Nazis trying to uh, execute a very, very evil plot Carlos, may I credit you? Um, Mr. Lepore has credited you with the whole idea, but it is it is a plot. Oh no! Uh, let me interrupt you. It's it, it's a it, it's everything. Great collaboration. It's a collaboration. It's not about me or about him. It oh. is a collaboration. That's that's absolutely, uh, from absolutely from beginning true. to end. Okay, very very good. Uh, I love it. you guys are so generous. It must have been a pleasure to work as writers together when you both are such generous. Uh, it, it is it is even now. It's, it's a great, great pleasure. And the second one, I, I promise you, is going to be better than the first one. You're going to love the second one more than the first. You guys are going to love it. And I, that's really true. That's a tall order. Where can people follow you on Twitter, my friend? Um, I, I have some Twitter account. I, um, oh, see? I now there's the trick. Davis Prop. See? Davis Prop. Davis, it's Davis Prop. Okay. Yeah. Now, but, we've, but fo we've already got follow Jim. Follow me uh, Follow me through the, uh, through the movies, just by the movies and everything else. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. I do. Um, well, I, I found uh, James Following Lepore work. on Twitter. I wanted to mention places or, or the website where you would like fans who are curious to go online and look for more about you and your work. Um, about me? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, just just, just keep, keep, read those books. And watch those movies. That's the, that's that's the answer for me. James Lepore has a website. Uh, James Lepore has a website. It's actually in the back of the uh, No Down mm. for Men. And uh, uh, it might be yes, jameslepore.com, something like that. It is. It actually, and, and, it's, it's James um, Lepore Fiction. You guys can definitely look on www.jameslepore.fiction.com. Yes. And I read those books before I said, let's do this together. And those books are terrific. They really are. They're a lot of fun. They're, they're great.
fun books to read. Yeah. Great thrillers. I can't, I can't wait He's to read some writer. more. I love a good thriller. Oh, and now, from the chat room, we have a live chat question. Question for Carlos. How much research did you have to delve into for your book? Uh, for No Dawn for Men? For No Quite Dawn for Men, yes. Quite a bit. Uh, you saw my bookshelves. There are, um, I mean, I'm, I, 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 and also, by the way, Jim <clears throat> did the same thing. Uh, is, um, I mean, there are diaries, there are novels, there is straightforward fiction. a wonderful series of books. Uh, by Ann, William Shire, who wrote um, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, but there are also his diaries. It, it really, really, we delved, delved into it. There's an amazing story about Hermann Goering and his castle. Okay. These sort of they were buttons, they were buffalo. And to dinner every night, we put, put it in the after dinner on stick occasion. The bisons would come out and he'd have them fornicate for dessert. Uh, <laughs> that would be the after dinner show story and in fact there's a wonderful book called, called garden of uh it was garden of eden or beasts of the garden of eden it's a it's a true story about uh dodd our ambassador during the nazi period and he was invited to these things as was the british ambassador. wow wow and in fact the british the uh, state department in in, um, in britain foreign foreign affairs department to this day all the bison stories that the ambassador had um, or there's a file called the Bison Files, to give you an idea. So, but the, and which I read um, doing all the research. I mean, we went, we did an enormous amount of research uh, uh, to get it right. And, and on yeah. the second one, um, in France, we, we, the first one set in, in Germany, the second one set in France. Um, again, just a, a, a lot, a lot of research. Research is so much fun for both of us to do, and we love it. And then all the pieces come together while you're doing the research. It's amazing what you get out of that. Just marvelous stuff. That is fascinating. I'm glad. I'm, I really appreciate that. Uh, a writer who is not sloppy at all about their research. I, lo I love it because it is its own reward to do that, that kind of studying and to learn about and those people and, and the lives that they lived and the, the, the conditions they had to deal with right before the outbreak of the war. And, and I'm fascinated by this. And I, I say, good on you, mate. As they say in New Zealand, good on you, mate, for for uh, putting it forward like that. It's really good stuff. And we also have uh, comments from the chat uh, where some of them have said, and by the way, thank you, Carlos, for Drop Dead Fred. That's what one of our... Uh, oh, well, that's... Uh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, yeah, thank absolutely. You. It, was, it was such a pleasure. You can, you, if you have the screen on, you can actually type in yourself in the chat room window, and you can say anything you'd like to them. They're all right there. And um, yes, Erovandi, yes, I do recommend... Downloading the ebook or getting the paperback uh, of No Dawn for Men right here. Um, I cannot wait to do, uh, after I finish reading it, I want to do some other online questions uh, with you guys so you can write uh, written responses and we can post a nice column on the main page. Uh, that would be really great if you, if you lads would be down for that. Cliff, <clears throat> can I just mention one thing? I actually have a direct relationship with The Hobbit. You do? All right. Please, please tell all. Um, I have a, a, a son, Jamie. He's 22 years old now. Yes. But many years ago, he was given the dog, a British uh, Springer Spaniel. And the Springer Spaniel's brother, my, uh, my son's dog's name is Jack. The Springer Spaniel's brother is a, uh, is, is a uh, his name is Griffin. And Griffin's owner is Billy Boyd. Right. Are you so, kidding? Billy Boyd himself. I am not, yes. That's uh, the Pippen connection. From, That's why uh, you know you know who first recommended your book to me. I was completely unaware. I Billy. Yes. Did you, that, I, a good friend of mine. That's exactly the connection. I for, I'm so sorry but, I failed to mention that. I want to tell everyone online. You guys know that it was Billy Boyd who originally recommended. I talk to Carlos and pick up a copy of No Dawn for Men, which I have right here in my hands. It, this is the very first God time man. that Billy Boyd actually sat down and said, listen, old chap, you've got to read this book before it explodes and goes nuclear and everyone's read it. So it was definitely, thank you. Thank you, Billy Boyd, for giving me the referral, first of all. Yes. Thank you, Billy Boyd. He was a dear friend of mine. Yes. And, and, all, and I'm actually, uh, my son and I are working on a project with him, too. 
So, oh, cool. uh, very cool. Uh, another project is going to be a lot of fun, a lot of fun. But uh, Billy's dog, uh, his brother, is my son's dog. So I'm <laughs> indirectly related to a hobbit. You are indirectly. You're, there, you're very, so there are very few people on this planet, Cliff, who can say that. That is so unbelievable. I mean, there's, there's two degrees of separation to Billy Boyd, or maybe just one dog degree of separation. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's great. That is so great. Um, Mr. Carlos Davis, um, you're a gentleman and a scholar, as they say. I am really thrilled <laughs> that both you and Mr. Lepore had uh, so much time uh, uh, to join us here on the show. We've been going almost 90 minutes now, and, but we're going we're gonna to wrap it up in the next five minutes. And uh, I will ask you the same question that I put to James. What would be your one-word review of The Hobbit films so far? And let's just, for context's sake, you have seen both of them, not just the first one, right? Correct. Yes, yes. Okay. I've, seen, uh, I've seen both. Okay. I have a screener of the second one, and we've watched it a couple times. Since, Fantastic. Okay. Since your, I saw it all. Your one word review of this new Hobbit adaptation. Wow. Wow. Yeah, there you go. Great, Justin. What do you think? That's a great one word review. Wow. I agree. Uh, yeah, that covers a lot. <laughs> That's really great. Okay. Best of luck to you. Um, and, uh, Mr. Thank you. We'll be back. We'll be back with the second book uh, in September. How oh, wow. That's sooner than soon, and we'll have much more to talk about as we get ready for the release of There and Back Again, certainly. So um, okay. um, I'm really thrilled to have you on, and please, would you please give a special, um, a special hug to my friend Rick Mayall and say that I will never, ever, ever forget him wandering into the wardrobe of Narnia as they did on that show, The Young Ones. It really blew my mind when he did that. Okay. Well, I, I'll see him next week in England, so I will happily tell him. Please do. Oh, yeah, it's great. And, and tell him lots of love. And, uh, and uh, I want to say also thank you for, um, for joining us and, and for all this great stuff. Look at the chat room. It's exploding. Everyone says, um, thank you, Carlos, for your time and sharing with us. And thank you for being on the show. Mr. Davis, good luck and good night. We'll see you very soon. And to you, and it was a great pleasure. A lot Cheers. of fun. Thank Take you, guys. Care. Excellent. All right. Very good. Well, I, I kind of think that that FaceTime stuff worked out pretty good. It works and, great. FaceTime looks really, really great. Should, uh, well, hello there. Maybe we should uh, keep uh, do a FaceTime and a Skype session uh, with fans uh, in future episodes. This was our first kind of big test demo of it to is. See, see if this would work. We are, we are mixing technology with the fans and with uh, phones and iPads and lions and tigers and... Mm -hmm. And, and skin changing bears, and, oh my. And alternate realities for No Dawn for Men. Uh, Which uh, evidently has a sequel, and they're deep in the works on the next book in this series that includes more World War II adventures, as if Tolkien and Ian Fleming actually knew each other way back when. Did you talk about the copyright issues of, of doing a novel about. We are going Tolkien. to. We did not. We did not work. We talked. That's what I'm interested in because why can they make a book about Tolkien that's completely fictitious, but we can't make a t shirt without getting the copyright lawyer saying da, 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 that uh, that thing is uh, ours? Because they have a little dis disclaimer in the front title page this is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents. So, show us our t shirt. Either are the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. So that's all. You just need a little disclaimer, and that's it. Yeah. It's a work of fiction okay. from, from the get-go. I, I, guess, I guess the written word and uh, books, uh, stories are, are, are protected, um, and, but, but visual mediums are, are a different beast. Whether well, it, uh, mer Merchandise is a whole different beast because uh, I was going to say you sell it, but you sell books. So you, you, but, but, this... but you're not reselling any intellectual property that Ian Fleming or Tolkien created. They created themselves this Tolkien. <laughs> like they wouldn't be writing about Tolkien and Ian Fleming if they hadn't done something significant with their life. Do you know, you know, let, let's, there's another great alternate history story that was written by one of our staff members on thewondering.net. You know Saruman with a double N? You know Josh. The host of our torn book club. The host of our torn book club. Josh Rubenstein wrote a story about a what if, a beautiful what if scenario, and it involves a time machine, as did that book by Harry Turtledove, Guns of the South. But here was a story called Ben, and it's about going back in time with a oh, time machine and bringing, rat. and bringing Ben Franklin 
Benjamin Franklin from the days of the American Revolution right back to now, today, to the 21st century. You know, and I, what would he have to say and how would he respond to the current political um, state of affairs in I, our country and other affairs in our country? Well, that's a, a great... It's a get, fascinating a great alternate history. Circle what around. What story? Maybe Josh should get a job writing Sleepy Hollow season two because well, the, the whole po principle of Sleepy Hollow is, is to reinvigorate American is, figures is, from the revolutionary era. Yeah, right now bringing bringing them back. I like mean, they, that. Like, I like it. The, the, they brought back Ichabod Crane into modern society, Icky. and there's a lot of Ichabod. There's a lot of uh, thing. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to spoil it. I don't want to spoil it. But I, I just but he that... would he would be a perfect. Uh, addition to the writer's room. You know Harold from Harold and Kumar? I saw him in the show. Where John he was, Cho? Yeah, I saw John, Mr. John Cho. I saw Harold channeling the evil spirit of, that was speaking through the Headless Horseman in a very, ex great. very exciting episode of Sleepy Hollow that I saw. And it's the only 30 minutes of the show that I've ever seen was that bit. And it was pretty cool. I have to admit, it was cool what I did see. Well, you now, know, if onward you, and forward. If you guys ever want us to uh, chat with someone on uh, on the show, uh, tweet at them. Say, uh, hey, you should talk to the guys at the One Ring Net. Uh, tweet at them, yes. mention us, uh, yes. everything them like that. Uh, because if you want to see people and chat about Tolkien with us, anything that has to do with Tolkien or Middle Earth, we're, we're happy to uh, have a conversation. So uh, let us know uh, who you want to see on the show by just telling them to come on our show because uh, that that's how I do. I mean, hopefully we'll get a few uh, few people through Twitter, all through Twitter. Yes. In fact, that's how we got uh, wonderful Noel. All through Twitter. All through Twitter. And Twitter's Doug awesome. And everything like that. So, uh, for, the... for those of you who are actually curious, and I know Mr. Davis said you don't need to follow him on Twitter, but I think that I would like to invigorate some of his Twitter followers. You know you can follow Mr. Carlos Davis at, at that's the little at, you know, at sign um, Davis Prop. That's D A V I S P R O P. And you can follow James Lepore, the co author of No Dawn for Men, at Jim Lapore. That's it. Jim Lapore on Twitter. And uh, you can also follow me at QuickBeam2000 on Twitter. And you can follow Justin at Justin's Big Idea because he's always full of it. Big ideas, that is. Oh, you know what? He's the, always full of big ideas. The, the other thing <laughs> I want to mention, you know what just opened is uh, the Streamies. I think the Shorty, really? the Shorty Award. The Shorty Awards. Uh, nominations, shortyawards.com. Anyone can nominate anybody. And uh, so you just go to shortyawards.com. Who deserves and say, to be nominees? And say, uh, I want to nominate the One Ring Net. Who, knew, who deserves to be and, nominees? And you have to give a reason. You can't just like tweet. Like You have to give a reason why you want to tweet. And I, I think like we, We've we built... did Vote Bilbo last year. Like this, The Shorty Awards is uh, exemplary community building on Twitter. Yes, indeed. And yes, indeed. I think we did a better job than uh, just about anyone. Than, I, than, I agree. Than, than anybody. I agree. And, and do you know what? Are we moving into our two-year anniversary this April? I don't know. Yes, we are. Are we? Torn Tuesday is going to be in its second full year, and it's about time we got some industry acknowledgement from the other people who are. It's in not that industry area. acknowledgement. It's voted on by the fans. They count all the tweets. So that go counts. to shortyawards.com. That counts. I love and, it. Uh, and then, and then the other housekeeping note is that uh, we're official partners now with Justin.tv. Official and, partners now. And we've switched over because. Uh, Efren is over there, and he's awesome. And there's a little bit of growing pains, but they know it. We know it. Bit. They're paying attention to our shows, as you saw in the chat room today. So he's he's there to support. Uh, they're going to be upgrading their systems over the next couple months. Uh, we're going to be upgrading our show little little by little. But yes, the are. whole point of this is just to be bigger and better. And this will allow us uh, to set moderators for the chat room which a lot of people have been requesting. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yes. It's going to allow us to do... And that's, the thing with Justin.tv, a lot that's of people good. don't know, Justin is owns Twitch, which is the biggest streaming service in the world. Like, Twitch.tv does all the video game stuff. And, and so it's the same technology as Twitch, which is, like, the industry leader. So we're just kind of... We're, we're jumping into the big leagues. We're, we're like, you know, you stream is just kind of like, hey... You guys set up an account and you guys go do whatever you want. 
But Justin TV is like, all right, you guys are awesome. We're going to help you get better. We're going to have bring in more people, everything like that. And as, as you know, a lot of you found us because we were on Stickham. And a lot of you found us because we've been streaming on the front page of Stickham. So now uh, we're usually on the front page of Justin.tv when we're live. And so bear with us. They're listening. Every time you guys have problems registering or doing anything, Very they're good. they're paying attention. So don't be afraid to uh, to scream at the top of your lungs as you were in the chat room because uh, Efren heard you and he jumped into the chat and and, <laughs> and, and, and made it better. So uh, so yeah, bigger and better things this year. Tweet at people you want to be on our show. And uh, and and this was a wonderful conversation. I didn't get to hear any of it, so I'll I'll have to upload uh, this re- to YouTube. I, re- I repeated and, some of the best bits for you uh, while you were there. And, uh, and uh, we'll upload to YouTube so I can watch it later. Basically, and there's then, a, there was a whole lot going on in Tolkien's life besides just publishing a hit children's book unexpectedly in 1937 and trying to teach at Oxford University. He was an actual spy for the British government when he did go to Berlin in 1938. That really happened. And, and Carlos Davis just revealed that because of the, the, the documents that are, have now been uh, declassified and the Freedom of Information Act and the other documents. So, so you'll it's, be able to check all this, this stuff out fascinating on stuff. the YouTube account. We're on... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll upload this as we and, do most episodes. And a highly recommended, very quick read, a real page turner, Guys, check out No Dawn for Men. And before we close, I just have to ask Siri. You're going to ask Siri something? Siri, are you an elf? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I can't answer that. Oh, she's not programmed to answer, are you an that's elf? That's right. Well, now that's not, not what she said. All right. Thanks for uh, joining us. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we'll see you next week, every Tuesday, 5 p.m. Pacific. And live from Meltdown Comics and the Nerd Melt Showroom. This is Justin. And, and this is Clifford. Clifford. Go back and rediscover Drop Dead Fred. You'll enjoy that film. And we'll see you guys next week. I won't. Bye. Bye. Didn't they remake Drop, Drop, Drop Dead Fred? No. Nope. No, well, no, actually, the author and the creator and producer of Drop Dead Fred is the guy we just interviewed. Oh. And he's working with Rick Mayall right now on a brand new film project oh. where Rick Mayall is going to be revisiting the character of Fagin from Oliver Twist, oh. but a whole wild new revisitation of Fagin oh, okay. and a new story.